the ancient Egyptians regarded the issue of life and death uh, as extremely important. Our civilization kind of avoids the subject of death, really. Um, we, 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 we're not, we, we don't want to know about death. Um, and uh, we, we try to shove it away to the margins and not think about it. And least of all, to prepare ourselves psychologically and spiritually for that moment that will come to us all. The ancient Egyptians put their best minds to work for 3,000 years on considering the mystery of death and what we may or may not confront uh, when we die. And when it comes to these matters, I would rather listen to the ancient Egyptians than any bloody modern scientist. Because the modern scientists are just pygmies, you know. They're infants, they're children. They may be able to weigh, measure, and count brilliantly, but they know nothing of matters of the spirit. We need to turn to civilizations like ancient Egypt, the ancient Maya, and to surviving shamanistic cultures around the world to understand, really, the mysteries of life and death. So let's have a little bit of a, a look at the Egyptian story. These are the souls of Pei and Neken. They're a mysterious brotherhood that was entrusted with transmitting the religion of Osiris to the future. So important was it that it had to be preserved and, and passed down from generation to generation. Um, Osiris was the first king. He lived in the legendary first time. He was the civilizer. He brought civilization to Egypt. And he was murdered by his antagonist, Set. And 72 conspirators, and his body was hacked to pieces and, and reassembled and, and, and revivified through the magic of Isis, the goddess Isis. And uh, here we see that, that what, what happens next is Osiris is brought back to life uh, so that he can inseminate uh, Isis. She hovers over him in the form of a, of a bird, of a, of, a, of a kite, and receives his seed and produces their son, Horus, who continues the divine, the divine line. And uh, here we see Horus performing the rituals that bring about the resurrection of his father in the, in the heavens. Horus comes to you, O king, that he may do for you what he did for his father Osiris, so that you may live as those in the sky live that you may be more extant than those who exist on earth. Raise yourself because of your strength. May you ascend to the sky. May the sky give birth to you like Orion. May you have power in your body and may you protect yourself from your foe. That's from the pyramid texts. Um, and again, this image from the tomb of Seti I, Osiris riding on his boat of stars, showing the way to the future pharaohs of Egypt. Nobody disputes that uh, when the ancient Egyptians looked at the constellation of Orion, they saw it as the figure of Osiris in the sky. This is not a controversial statement. Uh, Orion ruled over the celestial afterlife kingdom of the Duat. And the Duat had very specific astronomical coordinates, roughly between the constellation of Orion and Leo, and divided by the great river, the Milky Way, which the ancient Egyptians called the Winding Waterway. And again, all of this is laid out in the books. A lot of this is the work of Robert Baval. He and I worked together on the message of the Sphinx. When you look at the layout of the pyramids on the ground. Of course, everybody in this room is familiar with the Orion correlation theory, Robert Boval's extraordinary discovery, which has really revolutionized our understanding of Egypt. You find that the three pyramids are representing the three stars of Orion's belt. The Nile is just right for the Milky Way. I'm not suggesting that the ancient Egyptians built the Nile. I'm suggesting that Giza was put where it was because the Nile was there, and it happened to reflect a celestial item that they wanted to draw down. Uh, and then we have this lion-bodied monument and the constellation of Leo, which I'm going to speak about uh, a, bit, a, bit layer, a bit later. So um, Osiris ruled in the first time, and we shouldn't be surprised that the astronomical layout contains hints of very ancient origins. And I'll come back to those uh, in a moment. 
I want to talk about the journey through the Duat, this strange parallel realm, which is at once a place in the heavens and also a kind of underworld with narrow corridors and passageways and strange chambers that you find yourselves in and, and, and monsters and, 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 and demons. And you have to be prepared for every challenge that you will face there. In fact, that was what your life was for. It was to prepare you for that moment when you make the journey through the afterlife realm. Sometimes the god Anubis would act as your psychopomp, as your guide, uh, leading you through the afterlife. Um, the texts make it clear that there was a great secret in the fifth division of the Duat, which is referred to as the land of Sokar and of Rostau. And it's not an accident that Rostau was one of the ancient names of uh, Giza. In fact, in this image from the book of what is in the Duat, we see a pyramid, we see a sphinx, and we see a hidden chamber uh, with this curious figure, three-headed serpent here, a winged serpent very familiar from this part of the world. Go back inside those chambers and corridors. There's the grand gallery of the Great Pyramid. Here's an image from the book of what is in the Duat. A boat, a huge boat, is buried on the south side of the Great Pyramid. We find boats used in the navigation of the Duat, the narrow corridors and passageways. Um, strange chambers here with star gods seated. And the king's chamber. What I'm suggesting is that the Great Pyramid was your journey through the Duat in stone. It was a place where you prepared for that journey. And uh, I think that this room probably has something to do with this scene. And this is called the Judgment Scene. And it takes place in the fifth division of the Duat in the Hall of Mart. Mart is the goddess of cosmic harmony, of truth, of justice. Uh, and she is symbolized by this feather. And here we see the deceased, in this case one of the Ptolemaic pharaohs, because this is from Deir el Medina on the west bank at Luxor, being ushered into the Hall of Mart, which is also called the Judgment Hall of Osiris. And here in the background we see a set of scales. And uh, there are the scales. Here is the god Thoth, writing on a tablet. This monster is called Amit, the eater of the dead. He is part crocodile, part uh, hippo, and part hyena. And here is Osiris sitting in judgment. The weighing of the heart is the central aspect of this scene. And what we see here, weighed against the feather of truth, of harmony, of justice, is this symbol representing the heart of the deceased. You would not want your heart to weigh heavy with sin. You would not want that to happen uh, because uh, then you might have to face the eater of the dead and you definitely don't want to do that. Um, it's as if your whole life is weighed up in this moment. These figures here are the, amongst the 42 assessors in the Judgment Hall of Osiris. They ask you questions. Did you kill? Did you steal? Actually, all the Ten Commandments are there, and another 30 as well. And you're supposed to be able to answer all of them, no, I didn't do that. You're supposed to be, say, you're supposed to be, to, to, to be able to answer in the, in the negative. But there's a, so this is moral behavior. But there's a sense that the, that the judgment of moral behavior in the ancient Egyptian judgment scene is only part of the story. As though it's necessary to lead a good life, but not sufficient. It's not alone enough just to lead a good life. It's as though these texts, these ideas are, are, are recognizing what I said at the beginning, that, that, that comes down to us from many ancient traditions, that it's a precious gift to be born in a human body. And the question that's being asked of you there, not only is, did you behave morally and decently towards your fellow humans, but also, did you, did you use that opportunity? You were given an opportunity. Did you use it well? Did you live? Did you really live? 
that life that you were given? Or did you waste it away? That's the second aspect of the, of the judgment scene and the more difficult and the more complex one. So, Thoth records the verdict. If your heart outweighed the feather, if your life was lived inflicting misery and cruelty and pain on others, if it was, uh, if your spiritual potential was utterly frittered away and wasted, this is what you would face. Annihilation, never to be born again, never to come back. Your story is over. It's rubbed out from the book of life. If you've lived your life right, then something wonderful is being proposed, and that's the, the life of millions of years. And I just want to read a passage from the Normandy, Normandy Ellis. Ellis translation of the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead. I stand before the masters who witnessed the creation, who were with Ra that morning the sun rolled into being, who were with Osiris in the grave as he gathered himself together and burst from the tomb white with heat, a light and shining god. Hail Thoth, architect of truth. Give me words of power that I may recall my years and weave together my history. Hail Thoth, architect of truth. Give me words of power that I may form the characters of my own evolution. I stand before the masters who witnessed the generation, who were the authors of their own forms, who rolled into being, who walked the dark, circuitous passageways of their own becoming who saw with their own eyes their destinies and the shapes of things to come. I stand before the masters who witnessed the working of magic, who were with Isis the evening she became the swallow and her lamentations filled the air, who were with her as she shook down her black hair and veiled the gods' transformation in secret, who witnessed the conception of the divine child, though his coming was yet unrevealed. Hail Thoth, architect of truth, Give me words of power that when I speak the life of a man, I may give his story meaning. I stand before the masters who know the histories of the dead, who decide what tales to hear again, who judge the books of lives as either full or empty, who are themselves authors of truth, and they are Isis and Osiris, the divine intelligences. And when the story is written and the end is good, and the soul of a man is perfected, with a shout they lift him into heaven. Hail Thoth, architect of truth, give me words of power that I may complete my story and begin life anew. I stand before the masters who witnessed the transformation of the body of a man into the body and spirit, who were witnesses to the resurrection when the corpse of Osiris entered the mountain and the soul of Osiris walked out shining. He gathered his heel and his leg. He gathered his arms and his backbones. He gathered the dreams crackling inside the dark cave of his skull. He knitted himself together in secret. He came forth from death, a shining thing. His, his face, face white, white with heat. heat. Perhaps these monuments formed a, a sacred landscape in which the afterlife journey uh, was prepared to, the ultimate goal of joining Osiris in the sky, winning the life of millions of years. It's part of an ancient spiritual system, and what it celebrated and nurtured above all else was the gift of life. And yes, the ancient Egyptians sought immortal life, but they did not take it for granted. Here is Thoth writing the name of Ramesses II on the tree of life, the life of millions of years. If you ask the ancient Egyptians where this religion came from, they tell you it came from the gods in Zeptepi, the first time when the gods came to Egypt. And uh, here's the great, the, the second pyramid on the equinox, on the spring equinox. You can see the shadow, it's like a gnomon 
shadow running absolutely due west. Um, clues as to when the first time might have been are actually contained in the monuments themselves, and they require us to understand a little bit about a complicated astronomical phenomenon called the precession of the equinoxes. Um, it's accepted that the ancient Egyptians had pretty good observational astronomy, but uh, most mainstream uh, astronomers today would absolutely reject the notion that the ancient Egyptians had any no knowledge at all of the precession of the equinoxes. Certainly, astronomy in ancient Egypt was um, a spiritual rather than a scientific pursuit. There's no doubt about that. I mean, the second shrine of Tutankhamun is particularly interesting in this respect. You can see these initiates connected through the, through the third eye uh, to a star in the sky. It's somehow as though the, the study of the heavens is, is, is part of our fulfilling ourselves as, uh, as individuals on this, uh, on this planet. But procession of the equinoxes, no, the, the, the scholars say they, they couldn't possibly have known that. It's a process that we think is caused by the pull of the sun and the moon on the earth. It causes the earth to wobble like a top, which is slowing down. And that wobble takes 26,000 years, actually 25,920 years to complete one great cycle. And it unfolds at the rate of one degree every 72 years. Um, each of the 12 constellations of the zodiac gets 30 degrees along the ecliptic, the path of the sun, and the procession runs in the opposite direction to the normal direction of the zodiac. It goes, it goes backwards, it's processing backwards. Um, and uh, you have roughly 2,160 years in each house of the zodiac, uh, and these are thought to define the age. So this is why we say we live in the dawning of the age of Aquarius, um, because in our time, the sun is moving out of Pisces on the spring equinox and moving uh, into Aquarius. It isn't quite there yet. We're not in the age of Aquarius. Uh, we're perhaps not even on the cusp. Another 100, 200 years, and we'll be much closer to the beginning of the age of Aquarius than we, than we are today. <clears throat> Also from the second shrine of Tutankhamun, this rather mysterious image, Mehen, the enveloper, the serpent of cyclical time, he who hides the hours. I think this is one of many references to the secret knowledge of precession in ancient Egypt. And the Sphinx is part of the way that we can reveal this, uh, a, a marker on the clock of time. The great Sphinx, it looks perfectly due east. It's aligned absolutely perfectly to due east. And Santa took this photograph from the back of the Sphinx, uh, looking in the direction of the gaze of the Sphinx. And this photograph at dawn on the spring equinox from the back of the Sphinx. And there you can see the proof. The great Sphinx gazes directly at the rising sun on the spring equinox. Summer solstice, the sun is way over here. Winter solstice, it's way over here. Spring equinox, dead in line with the gaze of the Sphinx. And I'll just take another moment to do another short reading about the ancient Egyptian concept of the sun. Men praise thee in thy name, Ra, and they swear by thee, for thou art Lord over them. Thou hearest with thine eyes, and thou seest with thine eyes. Sorry, thou hearest with thine ears, and thou seest with thine eyes. Millions of years have gone over the world. I cannot tell the number of those through which thou hast passed. Thou dost pass over and dost travel through untold spaces, requiring millions and hundreds of thousands of years to pass over. Thou passest through them in peace, and thou steerest thy way across the watery abyss to the place which thou lovest. This thou doest in one little moment of time, and then thou dost sink down and dost make an end of hours. Astonishingly sophisticated notion of the big numbers and distances uh, involved in the, in the sun. Um, so the sun gazes, the sphinx gazes at the rising sun at dawn on the spring equinox. And it does that every year in all times. What changes is the stellar background against which that sun rises occurring. 
That's what's changed by the precession of the equinoxes. Um, and uh, precessional drift occurring at the rate of one degree every 72 years. 30 degrees gives you 2,160 years. The whole process, 12 houses of the zodiac, takes you 25,920 years. And using the science of precession, looking at the monuments of Giza, I can tell you that this diagram on the ground, the Sphinx and the three great pyramids, maps the sky not as it looked in 2,500 BC, but as it looked in 10,500 BC. 12 and a half thousand years ago, when the constellation of Leo housed the sun on the spring equinox, and the great Sphinx gazed at her celestial counterpart in the heavens, the Milky Way and the Nile, the three stars of Orion's belt and the pyramid. Um, very strange, this. Does it tell us that the ancient Egyptians knew that date and wanted to memorialize it in stone? Or does it suggest, actually, that some of these monuments may actually go back to that very ancient time, long, long, long before the pharaohs of, of Egypt? I'm going to move a little quickly, but I, the, the, the work on precession of the equinoxes, the fundamental work is Hamlet's Mill by Giorgio de Santillana and Hertha von Deschend. It's a tough read. They were, uh, Giorgio de Santillana was a professor of history of science at MIT. But what they document in that book is global, worldwide knowledge of precession of the equinoxes recorded in myth. A series of numbers that keep coming up again and again and again, all over the world, in every part of the world, which only can arise from precession. And uh, Santillana and von Deschend hid it in the little paragraph right in the middle of the book. They traced it back to some almost unbelievable ancestor civilization uh, of remote antiquity. 72 is the heartbeat of the cycle. Lots of numbers. 72 divided by 2 is 36. 72 plus 36 is 108. Half of 108 is 54. All these are what I call the precessional numbers, which are derived from and related to the process of precession of the equinoxes. And you find them in myths, in Viking myths, in, in Indian traditions. Um, the story of Osiris and his 72 uh, assailants, the number of stanzas in the Rig Veda. It's just all over the world, in myth everywhere. The story of precession of the equinoxes in numbers. Now, the Great Pyramid, Egyptologists know this, but they say it's a coincidence, is a mathematical scale model of the northern hemisphere of the Earth. It's quite simple. If you take the base perimeter measurement of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by a specific number, and that number is 43,200, you get the equatorial circumference of the Earth. And if you take the height of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by the same number, you get the polar radius of the Earth. As I say, Egyptologists know this, but they say it's a coincidence. Actually, if it were any other number than 43,200, I might have to accept it could be a coincidence. But 43,200 is one of those precessional numbers. It's one of those numbers that is derived from the sequence that evolves from one degree uh, every 72 years. 72 times 30 equals 2,160. That's one house of the zodiac. 2,160 by 20 gives you 43,200. Let's jump to Angkor in Cambodia. Turns out that from Giza to Angkor is exactly 72 degrees of longitude. Weird that. Another one of those precessional numbers. And uh, makes me think of a whole worldwide project establishing sacred sites at certain positions of longitude around the globe uh, and, and, and creating them for a very specific reason. And I think Angkor and Giza are intimately connected, although they seem to stem from very different periods of history. Angkor Wat. By the way, Angkor means life to the Horus in the ancient Egyptian language. That's another one of those coincidences according to the scholars. Here's the Angkor Wat temple. Look at this amazing axis running all the way through it. Actually, it just disappears. We're slightly off the screen here, but it disappears right over the horizon, miles and miles away. It's an east-west axis. Rather pyramidal form of all of the temples in Angkor. Um, and here's what happens on the spring equinox at Angkor. Stand on that causeway. 
look at the central tower, stand in the middle, and you'll see that uh, it starts to rise, and then it slowly slides up the tower, nears the top of the tower, and then, bingo. The whole place just lights up like a fairy tale kingdom. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing experience, and you suddenly realize that this monument, this temple, was built to connect sky and ground at that moment, at that exact moment. It comes alive. That's what it's, that's what it's all about. It's an equinoctial marker, just like the Great Sphinx. There are 72 major temples at Angkor. There are curious pyramidal hills in the background at Angkor. There are these amazing structures. Uh, this bridge over to Angkor Tom, 54 figures on each side of the bridge, another processional number. 54 plus 54 equals 108. 108 is 72 plus half of 72, 36. The churning of the milky ocean, a relief at Angkor. That's the same thing that's represented in sculpture here. It's represented in a relief here. You see the serpent Vazuki, gods on one side, demons on the other. Actually, these are the demons. These are the gods. Um, they're pulling on Vazuki, the serpent, like he's some huge piece of rope. He's wrapped around Mount Mandera, and it's a churning process. And they're whipping up the Milky Ocean, and they're churning Amrita, the elixir of immortality, the very same gift that is sought by the ancient Egyptians. That's what's produced by this churning of the Milky Ocean. If you trace the major temples of Angkor, you find that they too represent a constellation on the ground. And that is the constellation of Draco in the northern sky. And to cut a long story short, the only time that the correlation works perfectly is in 10,500 BC, exactly the same time that the correlation at Giza works perfectly. I'm not saying the temples of Angkor were built in 10,500 BC. They certainly weren't. They date from about 1100 AD, but archaeologists are finding that there's layers and layers of construction underneath the temples that we see today, as though they're reincarnations of earlier temples. So we have enigmatic ancient sites and religious ideas, widely distributed around the world, extraordinary similarities pointing back to a remote date 12,000 years ago. We've got ancient maps that seem to document the meltdown of the last ice age. Are we looking at the traces of a forgotten episode in human history? I think so. I think that's, that's what's going on here. Um, and because we've forgotten it, because we are a species with amnesia, because we are so much a mystery to ourselves, perhaps it's because of that that we're so lost and so troubled today, so haunted by the sense of something missing, something that we need to know uh, about ourselves. For the ancient Egyptians, the essential mystery of human existence concerned our spiritual essence. Um, that we are participating in this theater of experience that we call life and the world in, in an immense endeavor aimed at the perfection uh, of the soul. That's what we're here to do. Virtually identical ideas uh, were explored at Angkor. Well, in the modern world, sad to say, uh, few such mysteries concern us. This is it. You know, our culture today, we, we have a thing about consciousness, okay? Our, our culture, it admires, it venerates, it almost worships one single state of consciousness, and that is the alert, problem-solving state of consciousness that's useful for science and business and commerce and war and such things. And then we allow ourselves some downtime with absolute drunkenness and stupidity and abandon. That's also accepted by our civilization. But any other kind of state of consciousness is absolutely no-no and not allowed and not encouraged at all. It's as though, it's as though the world is, is, is conspiring to trivialize life, to trivialize us, to bring everything down to the absolute lowest possible level of, of, of uh, hedonism and consumption. 
with nothing else at all being projected as, as worthwhile. I've ta talked with shamans uh, in the Amazon with whom I've many times drunk the uh, mysterious brew uh, ayahuasca. And when I've asked them, what, what do you think is the problem with the world? What, what's the problem with the West? They say it's, it's very simple. You've severed your connection with spirit. You've cut the link. And you have to restore that link if you're going to move forward from here. You can't, you can't move forward from the place you're in if you don't restore the connection to spirit. And that seems to me the most, the most fundamental task uh, that, that all of us now, now face. Um, not these exterior trappings of power that have brought such horror and misery uh, to the world. W what's happening in the Amazon is, I mean, it's just, it's just beyond belief. It, 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 beggars, it beggars belief. It's, it, almost makes you, it almost makes you suspect that some kind of demonic force is at work in the world. Um, that, we would, that we would take literally the lungs of the planet and just hack them to pieces. That we cut down old growth rainforest, the most, the most extraordinary resource of biodiversity on the planet, 155,000 different species of plants and trees, and replace them with soya bean farms. You know, soya bean farms, which will only be functional for 10 years because rainforest soils are not very fertile. They're, 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 they're made fertile by the constant fall of leaves. Soya bean farms to feed cattle so we can eat hamburgers. What a bad deal we're getting, you know, from, from, from this whole thing. It's very, very crazy. I, I did a back of an envelope calculation. Six months' expenditure in Iraq at its height would have solved the problem of the Amazon forever. But we can't make that choice. You know? we, can't, we can't say to the people of the Amazon, we recognize that you have an incredibly pre precious and irreplaceable resource. We would like to take away your economic problems. Please just look after that resource for us. We, can't, we seem incapable of doing that. We can spend that kind of money on wars, but we can't spend it on, on, on saving the, mo the most majestic natural resource on the, on the planet. Um, I'm going to close with a reading from the Hermetica, from the Hermetic texts. Hermes was the Greek version of the ancient Egyptian god Thoth. The Romans knew him as uh, Mercury. And uh, in a dialogue, the Hermetica, many of them are dialogues between Thoth, Hermes, and various pupils of his. And in one called the Asclepius, uh, a lament is presented, and it's like a prophecy. It's a bit like the Mayan prophecy. Egypt seems to stand as a metaphor for the whole world in this, and to my mind, for the world in our time, this lament, this prophecy is speaking directly to us. So it's Hermes speaking. And he's saying to Asclepius this, Do you know, Asclepius, that Egypt is an image of heaven? Or to speak more exactly, in Egypt, all the operations of the powers which rule and work in heaven are present in the earth below. In fact, it should be said that the whole cosmos dwells in this our land, as in a sanctuary. And yet, since it is fitting that wise men should have knowledge of all events before they come to pass, you must not be left in ignorance of what I will now tell you. There will come a time when it will have been in vain that Egyptians have honored the Godhead with heartfelt piety and service, and all our holy worship will be fruitless and ineffectual. The gods will return from earth to heaven. Egypt will be forsaken, and the land which was once the home of religion will be left desolate bereft of the presence of its deities. O oh, Egypt, Egypt, of thy religion nothing will remain but an empty tale, which thine own children in time to come will not believe. Nothing will be left but graven words, and only the stones will tell of thy piety. And in that day, men will be weary of life, and they will cease to think the universe worthy of reverent wonder and worship. 
They will no longer love this world around us, this incomparable work of God, this glorious structure which he has built, this sum of good made up of many diverse forms, this instrument whereby the will of God operates in that which he has made, ungrudgingly favoring man's welfare, this combination and accumulation of all the manifold things that call forth the veneration, praise, and love of the beholder. Darkness will be preferred to light, and death will be thought more profitable than life. No one will raise his eyes to heaven. The pious will be deemed insane, the impious wise, the madman will be thought a brave man, and the wicked will be esteemed as good. As for the soul and the belief that it is immortal by nature or may hope to attain to immortality, as I have taught you, all this they will mock and even persuade themselves that it is false. No word of reverence or piety, no utterance worthy of heaven will be heard or believed. And so the gods will depart from mankind, a grievous thing, and only evil angels will remain who will mingle with men and drive the poor wretches into all manner of reckless crime, into wars and robberies and frauds and all things hostile to the nature of the soul. Then will the earth tremble and the sea bear no ships. Heaven will not support the stars in their orbits. All voices of the gods will be forced into silence. The fruits of the earth will rot. The soil will turn barren and the very air will sicken with sullen stagnation. All things will be disordered and awry. All good will disappear. But when all this has befallen Asclepius, then God, the creator of all things, will look on that which has come to pass and will stop the disorder by the counterforce of his will, which is the good. He will call back to the right path those who have gone astray. He will cleanse the world of evil, washing it away with floods, burning it out with the fiercest fire, and expelling it with war and pestilence. And thus he will bring back his world to its former aspect, so that the cosmos will once more be deemed worthy of worship and wondering reverence. And God, the maker and maintainer of the mighty fabric, will be adored by the men of that day with continuous songs of praise and blessing. Such is the new birth of the cosmos. It is a making again of all things good, a holy and awe-inspiring restoration of all nature, and it is wrought inside the process of time by the eternal will of the Creator. I don't know whether we're going to face some terrible global catastrophe or not. I certainly hope not. I hope it will not come down to misery and horror and awful, awful things. There's enough of that in the world already. But I do remember what all the ancient texts say. There isn't a single flood myth. There isn't a single story of the destruction of past civilizations that don't implicate humanity in the story somewhere. Our own behavior, and what we do, is part of what we're bringing down on the world right now. We are, what we are, what we are manifesting in the world, that is what is coming towards us. We are the authors of this thing, and we can change the story if we want to change it. I firmly believe that. This is the moment of crossroads that we stand at. None of us can affect changes on a macro level. It's impossible to do so. Um, but we can make changes on a micro level. We can make changes in our own lives. We can make changes in our immediate surroundings. Changes for the better. Changes driven by love and by, and by hope. Um, I'm a deeply flawed uh, human being. I have tremendous tremendously bad habits and uh, lots of <laughs> bad aspects to my personality. Over the last decade, decade or so, I've, I've, I've come to look at some of those things objectively, been very much helped by ayahuasca, the, the, the brew that I mentioned from the Amazon in, in doing this. Um, I'm working hard to change my life, to try to, to, to try to be a more nourishing person to people around me. I'm not saying that I'm succeeding. I fail every day, 
but I'm still trying to do that. And that's really all I can say when we confront something so huge and so, so overwhelming as the notion of, of, of global destruction. No, I can't stop that, but I can stop what I'm doing to contribute to it. And if we all do that, then I believe a huge change in consciousness will come and the world can move on and we can look forward to a future for our children and our children's children and once again bring this bright, beautiful, jewel garden of a planet, bring it back to the place it should be in our lives. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.